you. Thanks. Can everybody hear OK? Yeah, well, that was a very nice introduction. I did get passed over again by the Academy this year, though. <laughs> what do they so know? I don't think we're going to have a repeat, but. <laughs> that is their loss. But actually, everything else you said was absolutely right. Um, I feel so incredibly lucky. Um, I was uh, present at the, at the first uh, birth of the personal computer, an incredible time. And, and I'm still involved in uh, software and application development um, with the second great boom, mobile devices. Um, OK, I guess I'd better log in and start this. So I'm a little scared to be up here because I think um, I probably know less about um, uh, iOS development than anybody in the room. Here we go. Um, but on the other hand, I'm excited to be here too because uh, there's nothing that I um, am more interested in than innovative new kinds of apps. Because after all, I mean, what's more important? All of the other infrastructure that we build is, you know, is great and it's necessary, but the whole point of the thing is really to um, create something that people can use. And uh, that for people who don't know how to program to be able to use computers in powerful ways, I think that's incredible. So I, I think the reason actually that I have, might have something to say is my experience in the past. Um, I was a pretty famous uh, Apple II game developer. This was in 1984. It was a time like now where computers were entering a kind of a new space and people were really excited and any kind of crazy idea you know, would get serious consideration. Um, and I know I was famous because I was on TV. This was a show uh, that aired in 1984, and uh, Trip Hawkins was sitting next to me. He was the founder of uh, Electronic Arts. And that was this new software company. They were going to try to do something really different with, with video games. They had this idea that computer software could be a mainstream uh, medium like uh, music or video. And so they, uh, they decided to mimic the um, music industry. This was the album that my game came in. It was still a floppy disk. Um, and they posed me and, you know, with a, a, a good photographer, and they had a copywriter. It was very well put together, um, very witty liner notes. And I was featured like I was a rock star. And people were kind of not really sure what computer programmers would be like. Maybe they would be rock stars. This is a, an ad that they ran that uh, is kind of famous. It, uh, it's the kind of computer make you cry ad, and it talks about whether software could ever be an art form and whether uh, computer programmers or game programmers could be considered artists. I was uh, on my way to a punk rock party actually with the Mac team and I had my costume in this bag and the, and the photographer saw it and he said, oh, you have to put that on. So that kind of became my iconic glove, uh, but not really the right. I was pretty, pretty clean cut uh, person at that point. Um, so, so this whole artist thing, I think it, the way it worked out, it turns out that computer programmers are not really like rock stars. I think as long as we have to worry about whether we have every comma in place and we have to sit staring at a screen for hours before anything happens, that we're not going to be a performing artist. Um, and we actually did an artist tour. We went around the country. I went with Bing Gordon, who was the head of marketing and then became the chief creative officer. 
And we went to computer clubs where people were enthusiastic, but we would go to stores where just regular people would come in and no one ever came to see us. We would be standing there and we could, we'd be working behind the counter. And I think what really hit it home for me was uh, we were at a department store in Boston called Leechmere. And I walked in in my kind of programmer costume. I had some beat up sneakers and jeans and a t-shirt. And the store manager said, what's he doing here? You know, he can't sell video games on the floor just like that. So Bing had to take me through the store and actually go shopping for a whole outfit for me. So I could wear that and work at behind the counter selling discs to people. So for me, building has always been like this incredibly important activity in my life. My mother says when I would come home from school, I'd be a little discombobulated. But once I sat down and could dig or play with my blocks, that I would settle down. And that was how I kind of fixed things. Um, and throughout my whole childhood, really, we, there were so, we had such, um, so fewer resources. There was no, you know, very little TV, and we had fewer toys. So we were always kind of scrounging around for pieces and trying to put things together. We always had some project that we were doing. And that, to me, just seemed like such a, a great experience and, and great training for, for, after all, what do we do as programmers but kind of scrounge around with what we have and try to put something together that solves a problem. So I think this is a common activity. I often get this, um, people come up to me, and this is really great. They say, I played your game when I was young, and uh, it had a huge influence on me. But sometimes it'll come out like, oh my god, I killed the whole summer when I played your game, or I wasted like half of my childhood playing with your games. And I like to think that with something where it's more constructive, that this, it's not a wasted experience at all, really. This um, playing in a space is a very uh, important human activity. Um, I just came, ran across this incredibly funny one the other, uh, the other day. It's called the Grand C++ Error Explosion Competition. And the space you're playing in is you're using the compiler to try to generate a big error message. And you're graded by how, how big the error message is compared to how small your program is. And so this went on for a couple of weeks. And there were these different categories, depending on what techniques you used. The winner achieved a 5.9 billion X explosion. I, I don't know how that you would list that error message. And you'd probably have to wait an hour or two for it to scroll by on the console. But to me, the computer is really the most, uh, the most incredible platform for exploring and playing and building that I think we've devised yet. Until we can play with DNA, that's it. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about like, how I discovered the computer. I was a high school student, and um, I was a good math student. And one year, I noticed in the electives there was computer programming that was being offered. And uh, I didn't know. I'd never seen a computer. I thought, well, this sounds interesting. I was going to take every math elective anyways. So I signed up. But I didn't really know what a computer was. I'd seen, I had a toy like this. It, was, it had three bits, and you could like, make it count to seven. It wasn't too exciting. So I thought, well, I hope it's not that. But anyways, I took the class. And it turns out that uh, it was far more interesting. Um, our math teacher was an ex-IVM systems analyst. And she had convinced the principal that, they should, that she could teach a computer programming class. And we had no computer. But there was a business, and she talked them into letting us borrow time on their computer. And it was an IBM 1401. This is a picture of one. There's actually a working one in the, San, uh, the Computer History Museum. And it's quite impressive to go see. We got a tour of this machine. And um, it had 4K of RAM. They were core RAM and it, on little wires strung by people. And it, had, uh, it ran at 80 kilohertz. So that's like 0 0.08 megahertz. Uh, incredibly slow computer. This is like the kind of language you had to program in. It was assembly, so that was unfortunate. Um, but of course, we didn't actually get to program the computer. We would write our programs down on coding sheets and then submit them, and then we'd get back the cards and we'd check for errors. So it was very tedious, a very long turnaround. It would take like weeks to run your program. And the teacher did something that I think was very uh, brave and, and, and but kind of risky too. She didn't really teach us any uh, about computer programming. She just said, here are the instructions. These are the registers that you have. Write a program to multiply 7 times 7. And so I, again, I was in the space where like, I had these pieces where I could 
there's a compare instruction and there's an add, but there's no multiply. How do I do this? And I remember vividly, I woke up in the middle of the night and I had, uh, it had occurred to me, I could write a loop. And so I had, she had let me invent the loop. Tremendous educational experience. And I think a lot of people struggled in the class, but I certainly was hooked. And so I spent like an entire summer with coding sheets. I didn't even have the computer available, writing down better and better multiply subroutines. And then I moved on to division. And I moved on to, I wrote a square root routine. And then I got into big numbers, factorials. But they would shut down my program because they thought it was in an infinite loop because I was printing huge factorials. And um, I got kind of ambitious towards um, the end of high school. I thought I had learned Fortran. I'll write a Fortran compiler. And I didn't, of course, know anything about um, parsers or lexical analyzers. So I, I just start writing my compiler out. Well, that's how you handle comments. And then I hit the wall and got stuck. So there's kind of a lesson there. You've got to know like, what your limits are. And you, know, you don't want to be trying to do something that's way beyond your capabilities. So kind of oddly, after high school, I, I was so intensely interested in computers. I, when I went to college, I decided that I was, too, I was headed towards being too big of a nerd. So instead, I just did a completely complete 180 degree turn and became um, a liberal arts major in creative writing. And for two years, did nothing. I think I took one computer programming class just to get some credits. And uh, then I left school because I was kind of unhappy. I wasn't really sure why. And then it occurred to me that really, you know, this is what I love. I, mean, I don't know why I turned away from it. So I went uh, back to school. I went to UC Berkeley this time and uh, studied computer science. And in the two years I was there, I took one class that wasn't programming or math. So this is what computers looked like then. It was very different. There was a mainframe that we had one of those. It was behind a very thick sheet of plexiglass, though, I guess, to protect it from people. I was uh, taking a computer architecture class, with a f and that's where I met a f my friend Andy Hertzfeld. And we studied the Cray-1, which probably is less powerful than every uh, phone in the room. And there was a, a, mini com a microcomputer development system very early on. This was one of the first. But it was locked in a room. And I was assigned a, pr a problem to write a Julian calendar for this little computer. And I couldn't get anywhere because you had to sign up. It was just so inconvenient to get to the computer. And then you had limited time. So I never got anywhere. So none of these computers were personal. But I, was, I heard from my friend Andy. He was interested. He had an Apple II computer. And um, when I saw that, I knew immediately that I wanted one. At, at this point in time, it was really hard, actually, to, to buy one. I don't know if it was a, kind of a, sh a shortage or something. But I actually put an order in with a little TV store in San Francisco that was the only place that had them. And I had to wait two months to get it. So I was looking at these other computers. This one, I don't think, it looked really cool, the uh, color computer. But I don't think it actually ever materialized as a real thing. But finally, I was able to get my Apple II. And it was about $2,000, which is a lot of money. And I kind of bought the minimum configuration. This is the Apple II unboxed. And I, believe me, it was unbox worthy. I would actually use it at the, when I first got it and then put it back in the box so that I could take it out again, I think. <laughs> but you can see, it's, um, you can pop off the top. It had RAM. The, in the middle, of those are all RAM chips. And at the top is the microprocessor. It had slots to add on. And this was just, I just loved this machine. I think love is like the actual word. I mean, it, I love the way it smelled. I love the way you know, the, it, it worked. And um, I was, I, you know, basically, I was a grad student at this point. But I, was, um, I stopped like, doing any of my graduate uh, work because I was just having so much fun playing with it. It came with this manual. It was clearly, this was a machine for a, a programmer enthusiast. Because the manual talked about how you could program it in Integer Basic. And this is a, a list of some of the commands. And I think it was kind of thrown together because there were some of these very quaint pages in here with hand-drawn diagrams. This is uh, describing Steve Wozniak's shape tables. He was not only a brilliant uh, hardware designer, but also a very, very brilliant um, assembly language coder. And he had written this program um, called Breakout, which was a sample. And when I bought my Apple, it didn't have a disk drive or any way to save things. So I would turn it on, and then I would open the manual up and kind of fold it flat and then type this all in so I could play this game. And 
it took a long time, but I got to where I, you know, I could type it in and then play the game. I got really good at the game, so I got kind of bored. It was a low-res graphics game. Um, and it was more of a demo, and it, 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 kind of amazing that it was playable, even written in BASIC on this tiny, tiny computer. But I played it and played it until I was sick of it. And then there was nothing left to do but start to write my own games. So I realized I had to learn assembly language, and I started um, trying to pick that up. I had the benefit that I had learned assembly language from my teacher in high school, so it wasn't too scary for me. And I had this computer. It was mine, and I could use it in a kind of a relaxed way. And that just, that really was a fundamental change from like time sharing or batch you know, processing of jobs where you had to submit things and be so careful. So you could really play. And so my, my learning really, really went fast. This is the programming model of a 6502 chip. It had like three 8-bit registers and then a program counter. It had a 8-bit stack pointer, kind of interesting. So you could only like, you know, have so much nesting before you'd, it would loop around. Obviously, that would probably crash your program. Uh, and in comparison, this is a modern processor. It's really not even a fair comparison because those are 8-bit registers. They would be almost invisible on that other document, uh, other diagram. But, uh, probably like the whole state would fit into a single register. And this is the kind of code that you could type in. If you wanted to add like two numbers, just tiny numbers, you actually had to write these four instructions to do that. And you could put, stage them together to carry, so that the carry would ripple and would propagate up through the higher eight bits for doing a 16-bit number. But if you wanted to multiply, that was a whole subroutine. So not only was it a very slow computer, but it really didn't do a lot. You had to write little programs to do everything. I had the instruction card pretty much memorized, all the cycle timings, and uh, it was just really important to make, to make things go fast that you um, know all this stuff. There weren't a whole lot of instructions, but it always felt like, well, there's, maybe there's some instruction like the decimal mode math. Maybe I could use that. You were always looking for some little trick. This is kind of a, a skill, I think, that, or an art that's really lost now because it doesn't matter. Processors are so fast. Memory is the problem. But anyways, one day I got this book there was no Amazon, really. I would go to bookstores, but if they didn't have it, you know, certainly no internet. And I was hungry for information. And I somehow, somebody had a book. Yes, I want it. And then I read that thing through and through, trying to find tricks. So the Apple had um, kind of a modern architecture, actually. It had a processor that was basically writing to memory. It was not a sprite you know, engine or um, like a video game machine. It was a, Pretty, pretty much the way computers are today, just much smaller. Um, but Woz was, as I said, he was a brilliant hardware designer and a brilliant assembly language programmer. He realized he could save some chips by um, scrambling the way that video memory was mapped out and drawn on the screen. So that was kind of an obstacle for people when you were learning this because the first row of dots on the screen started there, but then you skipped a bunch of bytes. They were, it was interleaved. Um, and he did this so that he could save a few shift registers on the, on the motherboard, which was important. And, you know, the Apple II was successful, so you have to say, yes, that was probably the right decision. And he knew that you could just write a little routine to do the mapping to compensate for that in software. This sort of combination, his capabilities in both those spaces allowed him to do this incredible design. And, but it got worse than that. The um, horizontal mapping of pixels, they were you had three and a half pixels in every byte, and then the top bit was used to switch so that you could sort of get, you would expect if you had two bits per color pixel, you would have four colors. But Waz had a trick where you could get six colors by using this high bit. But of course, it just made things even more complicated. Um, so this actually created an opportunity for people. This, this kind of mapping made it difficult enough that I could be like one of the first people to figure it out. Um, this is an, another, just an example of like giving an idea of the capability of the machine. Um, if you wanted to clear the screen, say, if you just did nothing but the fastest possible solution, which was to just have a long list of store instructions, they were fast, um, it, it would take up 22 kilobytes of, of code and it would only work at 30 frames per second. So no matter how, what you did, you could never, that was a top end of animation if you did it this way. And a more reasonable version would, would slow down. It didn't take up so much memory, but it would be much slower. It would allow you to do 24 frames per second. So, so video games you know, had to be done. There had to be something different. You couldn't do it um, 
couldn't program graphics like you do today, where you just clear the screen and then render everything. Um, it was very important to kind of keep track of, of what was you know, dirty and what had changed. I'll get back to that a little bit more. Um, just as a side note, there's this wonderful project that somebody did. Uh, the, the notes for the 6502 were lost. It was a design completely by hand by a small team. What they did was they used acid to strip some old chips and they used a microscope to reverse engineer what the um, processor was built out of. And it turns out it has 3,500 transistors. I was really surprised at how small a number that was. And there's a, an emulator on the web that you can actually run in JavaScript to actually simulate programs. So you can type in an Apple II um, opcodes and a, a binary of a program and then run it. And there's a video that goes with this where he talks about the project. And it's fascinating. If you're interested in like, understanding how a microprocessor might work, it's complicated enough, but not so complicated. You really get a feeling for, yes, I can see how a microprocessor could work. Now they're just so complicated. I think it's beyond really human understanding. They're, they're you know, at, at like uh, any kind of, any except the highest level. So I was a grad student at uh, Berkeley by this time. I had my Apple II and I had seen this game at uh, Kip's Pizza Parlor, it was Pong. And I thought that would be interesting to try to uh, implement. This um, arcade game probably was implemented completely in hardware, but I thought I could do it in software. Um, so we talked a little bit more about like how we might do graphics. Uh, if you wanted to move the ball, you could erase it and then like draw it somewhere else, but it would flicker. So what I did instead was I always um, would draw, like I would erase where the ball wasn't and then draw where it was going. And I, had a, I actually wrote a very simple-minded routine. It was uh, not like high performance at all. It was just given an XY coordinate, draw a pixel at that coordinate or you know, the opposite, read a pixel of that coordinate. And I built games out of it. And so I was actually able to create a little Pong game. And I, 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 to kind of differentiate it, I made a couple of different versions of it. And when I, 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 was, I remember vividly programming the um, ball bouncing, just getting the, the thing to stay in, um, within the four boundaries of, of the board. And uh, I turned the lights off in my apartment and just watched it trail on the screen. It was just such a beautiful thing to see this thing you know, working. It was a very inefficient code, but it was fast enough to do this one ball and uh, just kind of mesmerized by it. I'd say that was another transformative moment. Like, yes, I want to write games. This is cool. So luckily, all of these games that, I, that, I, that I've written are kind of uh, still playable because somebody wrote an Apple II emulator for the web in JavaScript, another application of Atwood's law that if it can be programmed in JavaScript, it will be programmed in JavaScript. <laughs> so you can go to this website, and um, it has a whole catalog, I guess, public domain or nobody's noticed that they're there games that you can play. So here's. Um, Here's a little snap of my, uh, of my first game. And I'm playing this without uh, any Apple controllers. So I did this little splash screen that was kind of fancy, using my Pong mathematics skills. And I had a black and white TV, so I didn't realize that that would come out in color. I thought it was like a little white. So that's just the way it was. And it's very difficult to play with a mouse because you've got to sort of um, drag the mouse and it sort of affects both cursors in weird ways. I didn't get very good at it, but you can kind of get the flavor for it. And the cursor is me moving the mouse, trying to play. So anyways, I, um, I was... Kind of, I was interested in making some money for my games because people were saying, oh, you could sell these. And so I made a couple more Pong sort of versions. And I tried selling them. I actually talked to some computer companies, but everybody was like, well, we could try to sell them and maybe pay you. But nobody had any money. So everything was, everything was really tiny. Um, and my friend Andy, who was working at Apple Computer by now, said, oh, you should come down. You know, maybe they'll, they'll buy them. And I walked in, uh, I went down for a visit and went to Banley 3, and uh, it was just chaos. They were expanding rapidly, and there was the VP of software was the receptionist, 
and he was uh, you know, directing all these boxes and movement, and he said, uh, well, we can't really give you any money. I think you, it would have been a big pain to write a check, but I'll trade you this printer. And so, and the printer <laughs> was $700. It was a big, noisy dot matrix printer. I said, yes, okay, $700 is the price. I could write like 20 games a year. I could make $14,000. That was big money for, um, for a computer programmer uh, student. So I decided after I gave Apple those games, which were shipped for a while with Apple IIs on a little cassette drive, that um, I would write some more games. So I pushed my Pong stuff to the limit and created this version that uh, was like a pinball game, but it was really pretty bad. Um, every time the flippers moved, the ball would slow down because the processor was getting bogged down. And you can see the walls are only horizontal and vertical. I, I didn't know how to draw slanted lines. There, were, there was no graphics uh, department at UC Berkeley. There were a few campuses that had graphics departments. But this knowledge was all just kind of, you know, kind of esoteric. And, um, anyways, I put together these games. They were really crappy. You can see sort of pictures of them. Um, but they were sellable, and I met this guy somehow. He was a guy who would sell floppy disks to um, computer stores, and he would travel around. And he said, I think I can sell these games. So he packaged them up, and uh, he disappeared for a month. I kind of forgot about it. And then he came over to my apartment one day and said, here's your first royalty check. And it was $7,000. That was like more money than I made that year ordinarily as a teaching assistant. I was just stunned. So of course, I got greedy. Oh, I got to make more games. So I think I have a little um, clip of how bad that pinball game was. I'm, I'm also like trying to figure out like while, while I'm doing this, how did how did this thing work again? <laughs> okay, there we go. You can see it's not too fun. The, ball, the machine's playing itself, really. <laughs> and then I'm going to miss it immediately. So, but good enough. There's something about being first. You know, I, it reminds me of, um, I knew a friend, he, and he, was, uh, he had a fireworks app for an iPhone when it came out, and he was doing great for a while. He was early. <laughs> so I decided, I, I was hearing this incredible, um, these incredible stories from my friend Andy Hertzfeld at Apple about how fun it was to work there, that Woz was there, and there were the, all these engineers and fun projects. So, I decided actually to go work there, and I did. In 1980, I joined and felt like, boy, I'm really late to this whole personal computer thing, but I might as well you know, try this. <laughs> and it was an incredible place. People were running around. Everybody was really excited. There were a lot of things happening. Um, I was um, officially working on the Apple III, which I did during the day. But it was, I, it was kind of boring what I was doing. I was working on a, biz, a business graphics driver which I could do, but it wasn't too exciting. And I would write games during the, in, during the evening. But I was also very close to the Lisa group, and I was seeing they had, uh, that Steve and um, a bunch of engineers had gone to Xerox and been totally inspired by what they had done with the graphical user interface. So I saw this, and I thought, this, was, you know, this is incredible. This is going to revolutionize you know, computers, obviously. The mouse is a huge step up. And uh, that actually was, cost me a lot of money to, have, to see this so early because I interviewed at Microsoft about a year or two later and uh, with Bill Gates and they showed me the IBM PC in a room. It was in a special room because it had, uh, was part of the contract, it had to be hidden. And it was just so dreadful, I thought. They were going to be killed by Apple. And um, I, I think I was, I was right, but just my timing was way off. <laughs> So there was a group of engineers at Apple who were obsessed with pinball at, at this moment. Their obsessions kind of swept through the place. And, and so this was something they would do at lunchtime. They'd go to a pizza place nearby, and they, there was a pinball game there. And, and they'd show me like, how to play and what pinball was all about. I got this book. It's got all this fancy uh, stuff about like, how to um, execute drop catches with the flippers and do all these fancy moves. Well, I, I didn't really end up implementing any of that stuff, but it was a big, um, a big inspiration for me. So I went from uh, 
you know, in, in just the, a year of, of being at Apple and learning there, I went from this very crude game to this game, which I built in, my, you know, in the evenings while I, was, while I was down there. So you can see a lot more is going on on the screen. I've, I'm definitely not pixel plotting anymore. And I've got curved surfaces that the ball can bounce off of. Eventually, this is like an attract mode. And you can see the balls moving. So I made like a tremendous uh, improvement in my personal like, uh, skills from being in, in that environment of other people who were you know, also very creative and very smart and, and full of ideas. So I was, I was still kind of an immature programmer, though. I, to make this thing fast, you really couldn't have like a, what you would do today, where you would have a boundary representation and do floating point math and, and make everything robust. I created something more like the space shuttle, where every scan line had little tiles that would tell like, what the slope of the surface was there. And uh, it worked pretty much. There was a problem, though, like with pinball, balls tend to like want to, they start to spin when they hit, and I was simulating that. They spin when they hit the wall, and so it would tend to hug the wall, and it would go right through these cracks. And I had this terrible, terrible problem of the ball flying out of the board all the time. The other classic co uh, collision problem is that things get stuck. And it's very challenging, and um, it's a very interesting problem. Largely, it's solved in video games now, but you know, definitely I was struggling with it. And of course, my mature response was instead of to fix my algorithm and come up with something more robust, I would just by hand tweak my little tiles and, until it you know, sort of played OK. Um, another thing that uh, has changed a lot is that uh, pixels were really huge in those days. So it actually was important. You couldn't really have an artist come in and do the art. And so it was kind of an advantage. I did my art. And I actually searched the space of like ball shapes. And it turns out that 5x5 five five is the only one that looks good. All the other ones either look too square or too diamond-shaped. And so um, I, I did a lot of this hand tweaking. Anyways, I wrote this pinball game. And uh, I could have easily just done another pinball game, another. But instead, I decided to try to push myself a little bit and do like something more, you know, even more amazing. And uh, I'd always been inspired by these construction sets. Um, these are the things I played with, and I, I just really love them. And this uh, the one on the top left is a German one that's kind of incredible. It was very expensive, though, so I was always frustrated. That, but they had electromechanical sets and amazing pieces. They can be used for like industrial prototyping. But um, so I was clearly inspired by that when I came up with the idea for my next program, which is this pinball construction set. I wanted to build something where people could actually put together pieces and have that same experience that I loved. And of course, I had this, I'd seen the Lisa, so I had ideas for how I could um, make this thing work. Uh, the, the one thing that I really didn't have was the mouse, so I actually had to figure out a way. The Apple had an ability to connect a joystick at this point, and I had to figure out a way for a joystick to sort of fly the cursor around. So it's actually very difficult to use by today's standards. But in that time, that was state of the art. That was pretty good. And I had, inspired by the lease, I had created this magnifier app. And I actually used it to do some of the graphics for um, this pinball game, which was called Raster Blaster. Uh, I think it's kind of funny how, I'm, how fast and loose I'm playing with corporate trademarks here. But I was getting away with it. There's the Apple logo. You would not get away with that today. And I, I had a play on Bally. They actually did. Uh, send me a letter saying cease and desist, you know, but it was like years after this had, you know, had any, any sales. So um, this little bitmap editor was like the seed out of which uh, Pinball Construction Set grew. It was the first part that was working, and it's pretty much recognizable in the final, you know, game. This is the, uh, the standalone tool that I had. It was very painful. You had to plot each pixel one at a time, but it was still much easier than hand generating the numbers that would represent the graphics. And the most wonderful thing about being there, I actually left Apple after about a year and a half, but they let me uh, go and visit the Mac group. I had friends there, and they would let me go and, look and see what they were doing. Um, they, I guess they liked me, but uh, also incredible generosity. I find it astonishing, you know, given Steve's reputation for secrecy, 
that he would let me go. I just felt like I was part of the group. And they just tremendously inspired me. And uh, you know, I owe a lot of the ideas in pinball construction set to them. This is my setup at home. Um, I had my Apple II, and I had a black and white uh, screen for programming, 40 columns, you know, pretty painful. And then kind of on the other side of the room probably had a color TV for actually checking the graphics. And then in the, right off to the right on this uh, slide is a kind of an interesting machine. I was probably like the luckiest developer alive at this point with this setup. I don't know, can anybody guess what that is? Yep, there's another view. It's an early Mac prototype. It was in a plexiglass case. It had like a, I think it had an Apple II floppy and it ran the UCSDP system, but you could program it. It had the, the, the you know, the, the motherboard and um, pretty much the machine as they were, you know, conceiving of it at that point. Um, and so I, I was, I had all these toys to play with. So I think it's kind of incredible that I went from, um, that to that in like two years. And I think that's just a testament to what, you know, being early and, you know, developing your skills, but also being around really smart people who can inspire you and push you to that next, to that next limit. I think there's something tremendously valuable about, you know, being independent and, you know, having your convictions, but also you don't want to be too isolated. So I've got some uh, simulation um, footage from running in the emulator. I'm trying to play this game. This is uh, kind of interesting that it lives on because some uh, cracker actually extracted the binary from the copy protected disk. So I guess I, I'm grateful to him <laughs> or her. <laughs> and uh, this is the game right now. Um, this is pretty much as I was demoing it on the TV show. It's really painful to move. I, I, I had a joystick and you have to press the joystick uh, lever to push the button for this emulator. So I was constantly like losing it. And you just wish, oh, I wish I had a mouse, or even better, like a touch interface would be fabulous. So th those are some real, real advances. So here's a shot. It actually had a little circuit editor. I wanted to just show you a few of these different um, aspects of the game. And it actually took me about uh, 10 seconds of just playing around to figure out, like, how did this thing work again? It's like, you know, when you get familiar with something, you don't kind of see the flaws anymore. It would be really cool if we had a machine like a forget me Tron. You'd write something and build it and then forget everything you know about it and then approach it fresh. I think it would really help. So you could basically wire together little circuits and sort of control, you know, customize some of the logic for your game. And this is a shot of, uh, there's my mouse trying to control that little hand. This is the uh, magnifier. So it looks kind of crazy. So I was always really bad about, um, about keeping old floppies and source code. And it turns out that I ended up uh, losing a lot of the source code. But it was found. I want to show you just a little bit after this, there's a, um, when I published this game for Electronic Arts, they asked me to, I had originally published it for my own company, they asked me to add a feature, which was a little save the game with a, and, and being able to save it with a custom name. And it seems like such a simple thing to ask for, but actually it was terrible because I didn't have a font really at this point, and so I had to create font and rendering and a dialog box. This machine was really like a blank slate. It had no, there were no APIs really. There were a few functions that you could reuse in the, in the system ROM, but really you, you own the whole machine and you wrote everything. And if there was something that you didn't handle, then, so this is the, the part that this terrible, terrible feature that took me like another month. So like I said, um, I lost the source, but Electronic Arts apparently has this vast archive of sources. So this was a kind of an interesting experience for me to, um, get these floppy disks back, you know, and have code on there that was written by me 30 years ago. Would I even recognize it? And uh, actually, was, there was some suspense. Would these disks even be readable? Because you don't just stick them in a computer anymore. There's a special machine. They had to put it in. And they did extract, like, some binary images for me. And I, they're up on the web now, so they survived. Uh, some of my other games, I don't think the source code did survive. 
But maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> so this is just how um, I use the memory for this machine, for this uh, game. Uh, the low memory is just full of special tables. There are tables to calculate. You don't, you don't want to have to like move graphics into alignment so you would have everything pre-shifted. You would just use up your memory because you would be speeding things up enough that justify the cost. Um, it, it, it worked like a word processor. The game data would be in the middle there and it could you open up a little hole when it was changing and sort of so you could move it without constantly moving all the memory because that would be slow. Um, you can see the memory map of the Apple. Some of the memory at the very top is how the peripherals were controlled. And then all the pieces of the game. It was, um, my tools were really primitive. I had to um, kind of do everything by hand. Like the zero page was where you put all of the stuff that you wanted to access all the time. It was a, a slightly faster to read and write there. And so I would, all the pieces of the program wanted to talk to this page and I had to sort of map out like which parts could, you know, were active at the, you know, any given time. You didn't want two parts to be writing to the same part. All manually managed. And then the, 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 the source code itself was far too big to fit into like the Apple II's memory. So I actually had to break it into separate files. And then they were assembly files. I didn't have a linker, so I had to hand link everything. So I had to like sort of like calculate each piece where it was and you know, l overlay things in memory by hand. And then within a file, if I needed to talk to something outside the file, I had to um, define like a, a label for it and calculate how many bytes like offset from this thing was it so that hopefully I wouldn't have to change it every time I changed anything. And the other thing that kind of blew me away was the, all these handmade um, data assets. These are all the force vectors for the flippers. So you want more force when the ball is being flung sort of on the outside of the flipper. So all this stuff was like hand tweaked, very tedious. I analyzed the source code and just tried to figure out like what, where all the instructions went, what took a lot of instructions, polygon drawing. That's where you um, actually can edit the, the boundary. I, I made a full polygon scan converter. That took up a lot, of, a lot of space. And then other things were really small, like the simulation was pretty small. Um, the magnifier was big because it had some huge unwound loops to draw you know, fat pixels. Things were different though. A polygon scan conversion is the process of turning um, a, a representation of edges into, into pixels. Well, I didn't know how to do that. And I didn't, you know, I couldn't Google it. And uh, so I, I had a book on graphics, and, which I had to find in a bookstore. Luckily, I lived in a university town. Um, it'd be, be a lot tougher if you lived somewhere where they didn't have a bookstore with computer books because not every bookstore had a computer section. And there was this classic you know, graphics textbook, and it had an algorithm for how to do it. And I implemented all that in assembly. It's a pretty big routine. Um, this is another cool thing that um, the Apple II was so slow, you had to really look for every opportunity to optimize. One optimization was to use, like, you want to use the actual absolute address in your instructions. It turns out you could, um, by poking like uh, bytes into your instructions, you could make your code more optimal. So you had essentially self-modifying code. So you, right before you wanted to do something, you would modify the code so that it would be optimal for that particular task. This doesn't really work anymore on processors. It would probably cause a huge slowdown. But then, you know, this was like one of these techniques, these fun kind of puzzly techniques to do. Um, and, and a lot of people really enjoyed that, these, these small problems. But in the end, this is, it's just a huge amount of assembler. There aren't a lot of comments. So I was really not able to understand a lot of it. I have to kind of tip my hat to my youthful uh, short-term and long-term memory that I could deal with this. And, you know, and, and I guess I'm really glad we don't have to you know, write programs like this anymore. Um, so after Pinball Construction said, I did a port to the Mac. And that was really nice. I used the Lisa as a development system. I had a mouse. Um, it was black and white, um, but every, uh, otherwise everything was much better. So here's a picture of my Apple II. I actually don't own an Apple II anymore. I donated it to a museum, and they've got uh, a little display, my little shrine there. Um, and there's my red manual. Waz signed it with a very nice note saying this was the best program ever made for the Apple II. 
Um, but it's nice to know that it's, it's safe there. So, um, I, so the question of what did I do after that? I, um, I was still uh, working with Apple. I think maybe part of the reason they let me come was I was doing some stuff for the Apple II that they, that they wanted. We realized that we could do sort of Mac stuff on the Apple II. Um, so I made a clone of mouse paint. I figured out a way to render proportional text with these crazy shift tables that took advantage of the fact that the fonts never were more than five pixels wide and did some insane optimization. We were actually able to render fast enough that we could do a word processor. And um, Burl Smith was the hardware designer. He hacked together a little board for the Apple II that um, allowed it to um, have a mouse that could generate interrupts because you need interrupts to sort of track the mouse as the ball moves. And Andy put together a driver for it. And we had this thing packaged up. We said, we could make a word processor. Apple could be a software company. And Steve, I got to walk around Danley with Steve. And basically, he said, well, software, you know, it's a $100 million a year business. But hardware is a billion dollar a year business. And we're a hardware company. So that was that. But they did release the mouse. And, and um, I signed a contract with them to get like a dollar for every Apple II mouse, which worked out really nicely. I wrote a clone of Mac. Mac Paint called Mouse Paint, and um, came out I think just right about the same time, maybe a little bit uh, after. And um, I foolishly ag agreed to a little part of the contract that said, "And you will make your technology available as a toolbox for other apps." And that turned out to be like way harder than I thought because it really pushed me. Like you've, it's got to be usable. You know, you've got to do. You can't not not do that mode. You've got to do all these modes. And it just dragged on and on. Um, but it was used to build this, uh, this um, instant Pascal system, which was, I guess it required a, a, an extra 64K add-on memory. Um, and definitely, I, it felt to me like, wow, this is really pushing the limits of this machine. The software stack is tottering here. So after um, Pinball Construction Set, I decided that what the cool thing to, be, to build would be Construction Set Construction Set, which is essentially like, <laughs> a visual programming language. And so I worked really hard on this. This was a Mac program, and it was written in C. I, you can see I was obviously very concerned with drawing very small icons and having a very dense display. I think I was thinking about like some kind of a state machine and sp a spatial representation. And I developed it enough to make a Pong game out of this, um, a set of pieces for a Pong game. And I took it to Macromedia, though. It was like, I wasn't really sure about it, so I wanted to know what they thought. And uh, Tim Moss was the, uh, the head of technology there. And he said, wow, how do you debug this thing? <laughs> and uh, that kind of hit me. Yeah, this is, you know, for a visual programming language to be a good thing, it has to have, be some advantage to it. And, and so I kind of, I worked really hard on this. But in the end, I gave up. It was a kind of a failure. And uh, it took some time off from, from uh, computers, just you know, doing things for fun. But uh, I guess. I kind of felt like maybe it was time for me to have a real life. And I didn't think that I could do both. So I did that and uh, had a lot of fun windsurfing, kind of traveling, and getting married and having a family. And then when that, when that happens, all of a sudden you figure out, well, maybe I do need an income stream. <laughs> so I started to get back into the computer business. And the way I did was uh, by doing a port of pinball construction set to the Sega Genesis, which is a very different ma machine. It was, it's got sprite graphics and hardware scrolling, but doesn't have bitmaps. So it was a complete redesign from scratch. It had interrupts, really nice audio. And so here's a little uh, movie off of YouTube. It also starts out with the ball kind of stuck. But this is a game that somebody could build on a Sega Genesis, which is a pretty small computer, really. And I was really proud of the graphics. Finally, it was a 68,000 microprocessor, so there was a multiply instruction. You could do reasonable math. Had uh, you know, pretty good audio. The Apple II, you're always like twi uh, tickling the speaker and trying to, you know, in the middle of doing other stuff. Um, it was very difficult to make good sound. So everything on the, on the web about this game is all focused on the game. And because it came out for the Genesis, I think it was perceived as like a pinball game, really. Um, nobody was receptive to the idea that this was a construction set. We went to a lot of trouble. It had a really cool mode where there was a robot that could fly around, and you could rivet parts onto the board, and it would 
zap them with electricity, and you could weld the little railings. Um, I thought it was great. But every review said, well, these pinball games are kind of so-so. They really aren't as good as like the pinball games that you could get over here. And so it was really a commercial failure. Um, but Electronic Arts, to their credit, they, they went through, they published it. And here's the package. I think they wanted to sort of, they were trying to make it sound like it was a, you know, badass video game, virtual pinball, rather than kind of silly construction set. Um, I worked with this really talented artist. They had, we made skins for the game. My favorite is Blueprint, but he had this horribly gruesome um, body parts one. So I, I ended up um, working for a number of years at the 3DO company and building uh, libraries. To me, my career actually seems like there's a lot of continuity. I've always like, enjoyed building things that other people can use to build with. But now my customers were other programmers. I built libraries for animation and, and libraries for collision detection because I was uh, you know, pretty much state of the art with those things at that point. Um, and then I left um, 3DO and I worked at Sony and what I was doing there was building tools for game teams to build, th um, to build their games. And I, this was all built on Microsoft's .NET because Sony was all Windows. Uh, I really quite liked you know, what I did. This is maybe I, everybody always thinks that their best work is like you know, one thing, but, every, but the rest of the world always thinks it's something else. And that's true. Uh, my, my friend Andy was telling me that Bill Atkinson thinks his best work is like his latest um, app for the iPhone. And, but I guess the world will think, no, it's quick draw. Um, well, so to me, this was my best work to this point. It was all, um, it was used very successfully, actually, and by like all the studios at Sony. They were good about sharing. This is another, these are public screenshots. Uh, this was a level editor for building Uncharted. The other one was for the game Killzone. Um, and it was a really successful project used by many studios. Um, but then I, I was get kind of, um, kind of bored. Um, and I kind of on a whim decided to interview at Google. And miraculously, somehow, mistakenly, they said, yeah, you're hired. And, uh, and because I wanted to learn about the web platform, I decided to go there. But um, so I've been talking for a long time. I think, you know, I still am interested in apps. And like for the future, I, I see opportunities. And I really hope that I'm going to get the chance to build some apps. I'm looking at different platforms. When you get to, I've been programming for about maybe over 40 years and video game developing for like almost 40 years. And you start to really feel like, yeah, you want the impermanence of what we do and how much code is throwaway and what are the platforms that you can build on that will last. So that's really important. And um, that's still all being worked out. It's, beca it's, it's becoming very clear. That, you know, obviously iOS is a platform that's going to be around for a long time, a great platform to build on. You're all very wise to have picked it. Um, they're very stable. I think Microsoft, it's much more problematic. They keep changing things and really trying to find uh, their way a little bit. But so this is just kind of my personal itch, is drawing programs. This is like MacDraw in 1984. And this is iDraw you know, currently. And really, these programs, to me, they haven't changed a lot. They've certainly like much higher resolution. Um, and you can build much bigger things. But um, you still like, they give you a set of primitives. You can't change those. And that's what you build with. It just seems like there's a lot of richness that could be here that, that isn't. Um, here's a diagram type. It's called a state chart. These are really useful. They're used a lot in um, complex systems designed to sort of specify a system in a way that's understandable. And sometimes people even generate code from them. Uh, it's, it's a it's a hierarchical state machine, which is a really nice feature. But making diagrams, these diagrams are so crude. It should be possible to build a set of pieces that allow you to make diagrams like this. So that's kind of my dream. I haven't really let go of that. And, um, and I really have a lot of hope for the future that I can work on this problem. So anyways, I think I'm pretty much done. Uh, we were going to leave some time open for questions. I can come around with the mic. 
I was going to write down some questions. Why didn't you make some more construction sets? <laughs> I'll ask a question. Since okay. I was a devotee of your uh, application for your game. How was it the trend back then for the packaging to look like real life uh, tools, like the pinball, um, that was, rather than the technical side? That was my idea to make that package. It's kind of there's a funny story about it. I we hired uh, my sister and I had a, a, a were a publishing company briefly, and we published this. And we hired somebody, a designer, to put together some real pinball pieces and photograph it and make it look like it was a real kit. And uh, so that was, that was my concept. And then I, I, when I went uh, to Electronic Arts and they were going to publish it, the um, head of the advertising agency like, you know, had it in his hand. He goes, oh my god, this is the worst packaging I've ever seen. We're going to do like this and this. <laughs> so I didn't say anything. but. Um, yeah, that was kind of, I, we, did, we definitely wanted to get a, a beyond the Ziploc bag and the little sheet. So we had a little manual. We, uh, by, t by any standards, it was kind of amateurish, but it was pretty good then. Oh, OK. Uh, just a quick question. You're talking about uh, your sense of growing sense of the impermanence of a lot of the things we build because the platforms are changing so fast. Is that one of the things that it, uh, attracted you to find out more about the web platform right now? Um, yes. So I mean, the, just the ability to like reach many different devices. I thought I should learn about it. And just you know, when you look at like um, interactive document editing on the web, you know, like clearly that's really cool and uh, something I wanted to learn about. And, and I had just developed classic apps up until that point, desktop apps that you know, traditionally don't even talk to the network or the web. Um, that's all changing, of course. And apps do that now, just like there, there's kind of a blend. But also the impermanence of code, like say that you're writing a huge code base and then you decide to change like some low-level library that you use everywhere. It's very painful and you have to go through it. We're like, we're, we are really craftsmen and so a, I guess I, I, I personally feel like this dissatisfaction with programming. Like, why is it so tedious sometimes? Um, we have tools, but they're just not quite um, good enough. I, I mean, I really can't imagine a world where programmers like are like, shazam, you know, change this. And maybe then we will actually be performers, you know, using our wit and, uh, you know, quick thinking to, like, change programs on the fly. But right now, it's, it's just so painful to edit code. I mean, we're used to it. And it's certainly, we've made huge strides since like, I wrote this game on the Apple II. Um, so that's part of it. Like, which language? I, I liked .NET and C Sharp, but that was only Microsoft, really, um, although it is available on other platforms. Um, and C++ is just complicated, and it's changing. It just seems like, yeah, there's room for a, a, some kind of um, a language or some kind of way to make programs that isn't you know, so brittle. I'm, ju I'm just curious. Uh, so do you still produce games or things like that? <laughs> no, actually. So I, I work um, at, at Google. I work on um, the, um, on the web platform. Essentially, I work on the plugin API. Uh, we have, there's a, a lot of effort right now to make the web run um, native code uh, faster to sort of deal with some of the perceived shortcomings in normal web programming. And there are a couple of interesting uh, projects that are going on. But uh, plugins are still kind of important on the web, unfortunately. Um, there are special content types. When I want to watch Netflix, I have to, it has to run a plugin on my Mac. So um, I work basically in that area. But part of one of the things I really want to do is actually, and Google has 20%, is to build some apps. I'm feeling this, the, the urge to the point where it actually can kind of drive you crazy if you don't do it, where you feel you have an idea. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, what's your perception over the years of like, the barriers to entry and whether you think there'll always be a place for independent developers and startups to really break through? Oh, I, don't, I probably don't have much insight into like, how to get noticed in the App Store. 
but I certainly can sympathize. Um, I was very lucky when I started. I could write a crappy little pixel plotting routine and build games with it and, you know, and make money. Um, I think now it's much more difficult. You actually have to, the creative process is, you know, you make something that you want to make and uh, you kind of get excited about it and then you get sick of it and you think of some way to make it better and you just iterate, iterate. Um, so in, in some sense, it hasn't changed. You just have to iterate a lot more before you release to the world. And if you, I think if you do it enough and you have a, you know, a good idea and you're doing something that you know, nobody has done before, um, that you can create something you know, really great that way. It just, it's going to take longer to ramp up, for sure. But maybe a new platform will come along, right? And, you know, or some new, oper some new form factor. Watch software. <laughs> hey, Bill. Yes. So I'm, I'm curious, because you were talking about the web platform. What do you think the prospects are that eventually we'll get a web platform where you can do really serious professional quality mobile apps as opposed to just content players? When can we bypass the app stores? And, and hopefully, are, are you please going to make that happen? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so it was ne this, the web platform was never really designed to build apps like that. It's kind of incredible that the, you do have things like um, spreadsheets and word processors, um, even whole IDs. And there are many, many people working very hard to, to achieve that. But it's also changing. I think it's unclear to me what the, the final platform is. If you were going to like, sort of design, like, what would the platform be for running software on people's machines that was coming, being downloaded from the network? You'd probably build something very different. And maybe something like that will be, you know, but it had, there has to be sort of this, um, there's a path dependence. There has to be a way to get there from where we are now. And everything is sort of based on you know, building on this web platform and, because it's just so ubiquitous. Um, so I don't really know, but I'm definitely like, I, I'll be very happy when that happens. Um, it's really terrible. Building desktop apps for all the different platforms just feels like the wrong thing to be doing now. So I'm really interested in uh, visual programming. You've mentioned that. Uh, it um, makes sense uh, that you love building tools. Uh, what have you seen? or I wanted to drill down more on that. What have you seen that looks like an interesting direction for visual programming that either you've imagined or that you've seen out in the world? Well, that the, uh, the diagram, the state chart diagram, is um, it's, there's a, something called the uh, Unified Modeling Language. And it has uh, diagrams for representing code. And people actually use it to model complex systems. It's a pretty heavyweight process. And so it's not used by, like, we don't do things that way at uh, Google, generally. Um, but it has all these different kinds of diagram types. So those are used seriously. But I, th you know, I haven't figured it out. Um, I think, to me, like, a visual programming language would only be useful if it allowed you to avoid this sort of brittleness that I was talking about with software, where you just change one thing and it just ripples everywhere through the code. Um, I think programming languages are all, have all been optimized for building smaller programs than what we're trying to build. Um, so certainly any programming language is fine if you want to implement a quick sort, say. Um, we'd be done. It's just, it's like chips where it used to be transistors were expensive, but now that the chips are so huge, it's the interconnections that dominate and that you have to worry about. And I think with software, it's the same thing. You know, the, coding an algorithm, most of, the, what I, most of what I do at work is actually plumbing data from here, there, hopping threads, you know, making sure that things get to the right place. And uh, no language seems to be very good at, at actually handling that plumbing. So I think a you know, data flow model of programming, but I'm, kind of, I'm really waving my hands. I've decided actually not to tackle that problem because I think it's too hard. And instead, just focus on like, how could we empower people to make better diagrams? Because that's something where diagrams still pretty much look like they, they were drawn on paper. They could be so much more. There's a very interesting uh, guy, he used to work at Apple, named Brett Victor. And he's done some you know, wonderful thinking about this. He's got some videos you all should, you know, if you're interested in visual programming, you know, stop what you're doing. Well, after the conference, go look and what he's doing. It's fascinating stuff. I think he's doing it, he's, he's thinking of it more like a programming language, and I'm thinking of it just, just make diagramming better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.